Welcome to the Seahawks Man to Man podcast, powered by The Athletic. Shout out to the company. My name is Michael Sean Dugar. I'm here with my co-host, Christopher Kidd. Make sure you follow us both up on the tweet machine. You guys already know where to follow me. We don't got to do that. We do it every time. Chris, talk to him. What is up, everybody? It's your boy, Christopher Kidd. Be sure to follow me on Twitter at CKIDD206, and that's CKID206. All right, we have a special guest with us on the line for those listening and you know on screen for those watching. Uh, our first uh, coach guest, right, Chris? Yes. Yeah. Big yeah. time. We're doing it big finally you know we have from the seattle seahawks defensive line coach clint hurt join what's us up, clint, what up man good to see how you doing how you doing man, I'm, do I'm doing good i'm on the east coast right now trying to see my family but everything is good I'm, i appreciate you guys having me on oh man we, we appreciate you uh, uh uh taking the time um i want to i want to jump right into your story actually we're gonna talk about some players uh as well but you know how does a 20 something year old Clint Hurt decide that he wants to get into coaching? Man, I tell you what. So right when everything was over with for me, um, I wasn't sure exactly what direction I wanted to go. I got my degree in criminology at University of Miami. A lot of that was with, because of my dad. You know, he was a police officer and everyone else in the family was too. But I always loved the game. So I was away for a couple of weeks. All my coaches, Butch Davis, Larry Coker, guys that I was with at that time at Miami, I all said like, you would do a hell of a job as a coach. You know, you really need to put some thought into it. And um, so I came back and it started off in the weight room. There was no positions available on the staff initially. So they said, why don't you start off in the weight room? Um, you know our system and all that. And at that time, Vince Wilfork was a true freshman. So mm -hmm. it's like you can get a chance to work with Big V, you know, teaching my way, teaching my system. And it kind of just took off from there and the rest of it was history. It kind of, it kept, it kept me involved in the game, which is what I love so much and uh, kind of live through the players, so to speak. Um, that's what, what got me in and kept me in this, this, so far this time. How have you kind of balanced the on-field part of coaching, and this is not just in college, even now, versus the like quasi-mentor role you have to be for these guys? Uh, you know what? I had a lot of guys, so <laughs> obviously being 42 years old now, I'm a lot, a lot further along in my maturity than I was back when I was 17, 18 years old. So I appreciated my coaches and the time they took with me to help educate me in so many different facets, um, how to carry yourself, how to handle different situations, how you can handle things better. So I would say that a lot of great teachers along the way, the guys that handled me, it helped educate me and kind of give me the idea of how I needed to proceed um, going forward with a lot of these young guys nowadays. And, and so much time in college football, you know, when you recruit kids and you bring them to your campus, you're kind of like the quasi dad or uncle, you know, mm -hmm. now that when you get them there, you know, I never was in a role. I didn't want to ever tell a kid or his mom or uncle, grandma, auntie saying, Hey, you know, I want him to come there and it's all about football. No, you got to take care of that child. If something goes on with that child, you know, a family member, you know, you're accountable for them. All right. Not just about football. At least that's how I always took it. So, um, and you try to lead them when you've already been down that road before, I guess it makes it a little bit easier. You have some experience about how they have to navigate and, and you helped them mature and grow along the way. Was there a coach that you had that um, whose style maybe you emulate in that way that from that mentorship perspective? Yeah, he ended up becoming my best friend, and he was the best man at my wedding, Andrew Swayze. Um, he was our head and strength and conditioning coach at the University of Miami. Um, we still talk all the time to this day. Talked to him yesterday for Father's Day. Um, mm -hmm. But that man there was incredible for me. And like I said, still talk all the time. He's the godparent to my kids. I'm the godparent to his kids, you know, and now seeing them grow up and all. And um, just a, 
interesting dynamic in how we both grew up. He grew up from my, he's from Miami, Carroll City, uh, me being a New Yorker, and we just kind of hit it off. Obviously, he was my coach, so that relationship initially started off differently. But as I got older, graduated, and got into the coaching profession, you know, the relationship matured and just changed. And he was a person that always just held me accountable um, to everything. And like, listen, this is how you have to move, how you have to operate. And, um, and kind of showed me the way, to how, to, how to do those things, you know? So I appreciate him always. In 2017, you joined the Seattle Seahawks, came to the Pacific Northwest. Can you talk to, to us about that opportunity and how much you've grown with working with Pete Carroll and what are some things you learned from Pete? Yeah, so, um, you know, left the University of Louisville, went to the Bears first, and uh, let my contract run out. You know, a lot of people don't understand, and, and coaching a little bit is a lot like players. You know, you're an independent contractor. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yep. you know, if you want to have – got to have confidence in yourself as a coach, and, you know, you kind of create your own opportunity. So I uh, let my contract run out there and had the opportunity with a bunch of different teams. But when uh, Pete called me, it was something I had to listen to, obviously because of his track record. Um, I've always felt like – I wanted to take a look at a job, not saying you want to take the job that has the most money. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, you take care of your family, but what is going to be the best move strategically for you to help advance you professionally? You know, who you can learn something from. If I feel like I get to the point that I can't learn anything from somebody, um, obviously my superior, then it's time for me to get a change. And for Pete, all I heard was great things from people like Ed Donatel and even Vic Fangio talking about uh, – Pete's organization, you know, in terms of how detailed he is, leadership. And these are the things that I've taken from him. A great leader, um, really good communicator, and very open-minded. You know, doesn't deal with all players exactly the same, which is something I do believe in because guys are different. You know, how you have to deal with certain guys is different than how you deal with others. Um, but at the same time, I still got to stay unique to myself. You know, I think a lot of coaches, young coaches, they make the mistake of trying to emulate who they're working for, you got to stay true to yourself. So I appreciate uh, how, you know, Pete's patience, his leadership, um, and how detailed he is, uh, you know, organizing everything. And he always sees things in advance, you know, particularly defensively. Like when things start going on, he's always ahead of the game saying, you know, this is what teams going to start doing to you. So mm-hmm. you got to be prepared. Sometimes as coaches, you get stubborn. Like, why are we getting ready for something that we're not seeing? You know, it's like, don't create a ghost is what we say. But for Pete, he's already ahead of it because next thing you know, we start seeing the same the stuff he was talking about. Fortunately, he doesn't come in there and try to tell you, oh, well, I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> I want to step off the field a little bit, like, and go it's over the last 13 months, you know, as a as a black man who's also a, a football coach. So what were these last 13 months like for you away from football? Um, what I would say is educational. And the reason why I say that is, um, one, I've never been a big like news and politics guy and all that kind of stuff. Um, but obviously with not being able to go to the building and things like that last off season and seeing some of the things I saw, it was kind of like, this is why I don't like watching it, but mm. it brought into reality for the rest of the country, the things that we have been talking about for forever. Okay. Um, but when I say educational for my kids, you know, for my kids, they're doing, you know, in the uh, in home learning and all virtually and now they get a chance to see like okay what is what is mom and dad looking at and they're seeing what happened with george floyd they're hearing the stories of what happened with brianna taylor and brianna taylor and ahmaud arbery and they'll see the emotions for my kids because they don't live in that reality they didn't grow up like my wife and i did my wife grew up in the north side of jacksonville and some of the experiences that we've had it's, you know one it's a blessing for our children but it's also something for my wife and I was like, hold on, they're not from where we're from. We, they have not seen what we've seen already, even in our young lives. So, you know, my daughter is 12 years old, so she's a preteen. My son just recently turned 11. So a lot of these things are learning. So it's educating them because we've always taught our children to judge people off their character. We're not going to judge people by the color of their skin. You know, you want to treat, treat everyone the same. Treat them with respect exactly how you want to be treated. But then when they see all the stuff on the news, it's like, you know, why should we like white people again? You know, mm-hmm. that's the that's right, legitimate right. stuff that they ask. And I'm like, listen, because not everybody is the same. And it's it makes me appreciate those, but anyone, it doesn't matter your ethnicity that has treated me with fairness, was good to me, that helped me along the way. Because it wasn't just all black people that helped me be successful. All right. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what 
we're in a tough spot in this country because in the last 13 months, like you asked me, there's the uncomfortable conversations that got to take place on both sides in order for everything to come together. If not, then we'll just be fighting this thing forever. But, you know, uh, but education for how, you know, talk to my kids about what's going on in this world today, making sure they keep an open mind and, you know, and treat everyone fairly. But also, you know, for my son and my daughter, when they're able to drive, you got to educate them on, you know, you get pulled over by a police officer. Same thing my dad did with me. My dad was a cop for 21 years. You know, he was like, listen, I don't give a damn about your attitude. I don't care about how pissed off you may be. My number one goal is I want to make sure I get you home. All right. That's all I care about. So I've already started that education with my kids now and they won't be behind the wheel of a car anytime soon, but it's never too early. You know, never yeah, too no. Early Chris and I don't have kids. I mean, we'd be around little, little, uh, little people every once in a while again, cousins or whatever, and nothing sparks an uncomfortable conversation like a very honest question from a kid. Because <laughs> yeah, kids no just want to know it just straight. There's, there's no filter. It's like, hey, why is this happening? It's like, ooh, how do I answer that? Yeah, how do we? And if, but it, as an adult, as adults, it forces us to like sometimes grapple with stuff we didn't even think about. Yep. You know, or ever thought to explain. Kids will change your perspective, man. I, I say this. I told my wife, if I didn't have kids, I might be a lot more reckless in terms of my thoughts and how frustrating some of the things that, you know, how they are when you see them on television and once you get all the facts to these stories. But when you have kids, man, and you know that your number one thing is to protect and provide for them, um, you got to take a step back. And, you know, and sometimes you, you got to come with a very, as much as you may grit your teeth, that in you it may not be the way how you would handle it. If you want to make sure your kids come home at night, you got to give a much more honest assessment, you know, and or, you know, calmer tone of voice and, 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 and give them a bigger perspective. Like, listen, it's not about your ego. It's not about how you're feeling on these things. Sometimes, you know, cops are allowed to have bad days, too. You know, but at the same time, um, you know, there is definitely a lot of relationships with, you know, the African-American community and police officers that have to definitely be improved without question. You mentioned your, your father was a detective in Harlem for 21 years. Just how how has that experience shaped the conversations you're having with people in the last 13 months? Because that's a very unique like perspective to have. You know what? As soon as I mention it, it's crickets. Uh, <laughs> you know, they don't, <laughs> wow. they don't say anything. You know, when the whole thing came with, um, you know, standing for the flag, um, when that conversation comes up or dealing with police. And then I explained to them, my father was a POW in Vietnam, you know, crickets. And because my dad was the first one to tell me, you know, I don't get offended when he sees, when he sees uh, anyone stand for what they believe in when it comes to issues that's within this country. My dad will be the first one to say this is the best country in the world. But at the same time, you know, you have freedom of, you got freedom of speech, freedom of choice, you know, and even though you may not agree with things, you can still vocalize that in a peaceful manner. And he never took offense to Colin Kaepernick's decision to take a knee and any of our players. You know, and I talked to my dad about that frequently. He's like, listen, I was a damn POW in, in the war. He was a POW for two months. He said, I have no problem with that. He said, I got the hell kicked out of me for two months. I'm not pissed off at a player for taking a knee uh, for any one fight. He said, that's the whole reason, you know, he's, his feelings on Vietnam was totally different. He didn't agree with the war, mm -hmm. but, you know, it was part, you know, something he had to do. But the whole thing is, he said, we fought for these rights. He said, if someone, you know, vocalizes or expresses it in a peaceful manner, he never had a problem with that. And in terms of dealing with uh, interaction with the police and the community, you know, he said the issues nowadays, he sees it twofold. You know, one is the lack of ability to communicate with the police officers, you know, to the youth in our country, that, that, that uh, the honesty, the communication, the openness has been fractured. He talked about when he was a police officer in Harlem and, you know, and being in that area, how you would get out of your car and you would talk with people in the community, aunts, uncles, grandpas, dads, like you knew the people in the community because the community were helping to raise the children, mm -hmm. you know. But now, now today, sometimes some of these kids, they, they get out of pocket. You know, let's be honest about that. Some get out of pocket. But then on the other side, too, again, some of the cops don't know how to communicate and talk with some of the young people, too. So there's issues on both sides. I wouldn't say it goes both, you know, it's, it's not all on one side of the coin, you know? Some people may not want to hear it, but it's the truth. With that in mind, then, let's take, let's go further back in the past 13 months. Like, how did you, that 2017 experience with Michael Bennett, 
Like, how did you deal with all of that? You know, with him, uh, for people who aren't familiar, Michael Bennett was at the fight. I think it was Floyd and McGregor uh, had the police uh, uh, basically, uh, what's the word? I want detain to him and then yeah, put a gun. Him, yeah. put a gun to his head, threaten to kill him. Mike tells the world that this happened and how shook up he was. This is uh, in August 2017. Um, like you're, you know, you're his position coach at the time, your first year with the team. Father's a cop. You're a black man. Like, how did all that go down? Um, you know, with your your defensive line room back then. Number one, obviously, we all wanted to make sure that Mike was okay. You know, make sure he was safe and and make sure he was all right. And he was obviously. Uh, Rounding him up at that time and taking everything in that he had had to say about that experience. What I would say is, number one, a lot of people, I still, even to this day, my dad was a cop. If I see, if I get caught speeding or if I make a mistake traffic wise, even I still, my heart will start racing when I get pulled over by a cop. And I'll say that honestly, that's still how mm -hmm. I feel. Even all the education I know, rolling down my window, putting my hands outside the window so the cop knows that he's safe, he can see my hands roll down the back windows too. As a black man right now with how some of these things are going in this country, we all still get nervous. So when you get into that kind of moment and things get frantic and whatnot, I totally understand where he's coming from. I feel that way now. I felt that way in 2017 when it happened, um, speaking on that. Um, but for what Mike has said, you know, having a gun pulled on him and whatnot and the threats, this is that's exactly what I'm saying. Like, if you're a police officer, my dad has said this. He was a cop for 21 years. He never had to pull his gun on anybody. Mm -hmm. All right. Never had to pull his gun on anybody. So but he's a peaceful man by nature, too. So my whole thing is, is like what gets it to the point where if you feel like you have to pull your firearm. What, what really is going on? Is your life really in danger? Mike is a six foot four, 275, 280 pound man. If you are in danger, you're going to know you're, you're in danger. So I just don't. So so some of those situations, I don't I don't understand why it gets to that point. But in, for Mike, I support Mike. I know mm -hmm. Mike. I know his family. I support him then. I still support him now. I know what Mike is all about. You know, but unless you're in the heat of the moment and you're there to witness exactly what's going on, um, I'm always going to side with the guy who I know. And I know Mike. Uh, with all that in mind as well, what did Pete Carroll's speech that he gave to us? I'm sure you guys all saw it. Uh, the, the, he gave it to us on Zoom last August about race. He didn't take any questions, just about 17 minutes straight from the heart. Uh, what, did, what did that mean to you? Maybe some of the other coaches um, when he when he had those words. It meant a lot. You know, it meant a lot because obviously um, it's not a comfortable thing to say. You know, there's gonna there has to be uncomfortable conversations. And we really, really, really want to fix a lot of the issues we have with race in this country and race relations between the white and the black community, then there has to be a high level of open mindedness and people got to be willing to change and things have to be people have to be willing to say some things. And hopefully there's there's truth behind your words. I believe in Pete. I believe in what he said, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I know that he and Glenna, uh, his wife, they want to be a part of, you know, anything they can do to try to be uh, helpful in that change or helping to bring the community together. So uh, I, we definitely appreciated it. Um, and where, you know, his viewpoint, where he's coming from. And like I said, since I've been with him, Pete has always stuck by his word and, you know, stuck by his, convic his convictions and what he has said. So I appreciate it. And what was your initial thought to the entire National Football League taking their first step towards social injustice and speaking about it, even though it might have felt uncomfortable with certain teams because they maybe didn't hit on certain things that we thought as African-American males and women that they should have? What was your initial thought process when you witnessed that across the league? Uh, you know, I, I thought it was a step in the right direction, um, trying to bring, you know, bring things together. But the only thing I would say is, and what I want to actually keep an eye on myself is as, as we progress forward is to see us continue to move that way. Just don't let it be something that lasts for just one season or yeah. a couple of minutes. Like this stuff has been going on for forever for over 400 years okay mm -hmm. <laughs> and league's been around for a little over 100 like one season ain't gonna fix this yeah so you gotta we gotta continue to you know progress forward the players association the league even the coaches everyone that's involved in this to continue you know uh pushing forward collectively as a league to help fix these issues you know it starts somewhere let's be a part of the change let's not just do something to to get likes and make it look good for a little bit and then all of a sudden well all right we're back to normal business as usual that ain't that that can't fly yeah, and now the toughest part here is transitioning into actual football after this. We just powerful... gotta do it. We just, <laughs> just, just, just gotta go. We gotta after go. such we a powerful discussion, but we do want to get into the past for us because you are the man when it comes to that. 
it's real easy for people like us or fans in general to say, bro, pass rush, all you do is put your head down and just go forward and get the quarterback. But in actuality, <laughs> exactly. In actuality, it goes beyond just putting your head down and getting to the quarterback. What are some of the intricates and things that you have set up so that it can be a successful pass rush and the Seahawks are moving in the right direction and getting after the quarterback? Man, so many things. Let's let's go first from the player standpoint before you talk schematics. From the player standpoint, the number one thing you want to have is depth. You got to have a rotation. And one thing that's so exciting to me about this season right now, coming into this season, is the quality of depth that we had. Yes. When I first got here in 2017, we had quality of depth, but it quickly got diminished because of the freak injuries. You know, Cliff got his uh, Cliff Abel got his neck injury in the third game against Indianapolis in 2017. Mike B had his plantar fascia issue in 2017, and guys started getting nicks and bangs. You know, so things change fast. The injuries are part of the game. It's never an excuse. You work through it. Last year, in the beginning of the last season, that was a major problem for us. Mm-hmm. You know, um, with having quality depth where you keep your rotation fresh. Uh, Benson Mayoa and Bruce Irvin, who have been uh, really high-level rotational players their whole career, they're thrust into a situation where they're playing 90 92% of the plays last year. Pass rushing takes a lot of energy, a lot of effort, mm-hmm. a lot of juice. So when you're having to play that many snaps, it's hard to have a high level of success rushing a passer when you're running out of gas. So now to have, you know, Daryl Taylor being healthy, so excited to see him and what he, what he got done this uh, offseason. And now adding him in with Benson, Carlos coming back, um, having Alden Smith and uh, Puna, LJ, Rasheem, the you know, list goes on and on. We have a lot of depth. And I would say this offseason, I felt I feel really, really good going into this season about where we're at and where we're going forward. Um, in terms of the schematic stuff, uh, putting it all together, all right, one is, we don't talk about this enough, is the cohesion amongst the guys rushing together. You know, generally when you're talking about big guys and cohesion, you say, okay, the offensive line, you know, can those five guys play together? Pass rushing is the same thing. Um, mm-hmm. When you're rushing one-on-one with a guy, it takes time to get to know how a guy pass rushes with you. I remember Cliff and Mike B used to have, they used to bang heads all the time because Mike B rushes a little bit wide sometimes when he was at three technique and Cliff would get frustrated because he's like, I have no counter moves because Mike B is always in the dog on B gap. <laughs> but eventually, you know, you figure those things out and you end up working together. And uh, because there's rush lanes, rush lanes nowadays are more important than ever because of all the athletic quarterbacks, mm. whether you're playing Kyler Murray or, you know, now the young kid that San Francisco just drafted, you know, so many young athletic quarterbacks around the league. You got to make sure you keep the quarterback in fine because not only do we have to beat a 330 pound guy in front of us, we also got to now go and tackle these little damn squirrels that want to run all over the damn <laughs> field. And right. Get them down. So it's a challenging job. Um, and then in terms of developing the rushers, is now some of these kids, a lot of them, when they come out of college, they don't have a rush plan. So when people say, well, what the hell does he mean by a rush plan? That means, okay. Whether I'm a side, what am I doing with my hands? If I'm a side scissor guy, a long arm guy, you know, those kinds of things, that's the plan, okay? And you generally build that stuff off of a guy's physical traits. You know, the longer a guy is, you like the long arm extend because he can play with length and it's hard for uh, offensive linemen to get their hands on him. If you deal with a guy who's got really quick hands, good hand eye coordination, side scissors, things like that with the hands, and then you always try to you get that ironed out, say, okay, this is your go to move. Then you got to have a counter, all right, that looks the same to a blocker, you know, when you got to deal with that. I, I equate pass rushing to being like a great baseball pitcher. If every time you get up on the mound and you do certain things on the approach and you're throwing a fastball, but then you do something different, you throw a curveball, well, every hitter is going to be smacking your stuff out of the park. Mm-hmm. So as a pass rusher, all of your stuff has to look the same and you have to be able to react to the different sets and things like that you get from blockers. So there's a lot that goes on to it. Um, to developing the individual player, uh, to getting guys accustomed to how they rush together, the execution of D-line games, and obviously when it comes to pressures and things like that, uh, blitz packages, I mean, by that, there's a lot that goes in. It's very, it's, it's time-consuming, but it's also really fun because it's really re- rewarding. Yeah, I had, the, I had the pleasure of watching the Buffalo game this last year. I was with Cliff. We were watching it, and just hearing him during the game, like teaching like a, a rushing half a man, all the different fronts he was IDing. Like I'm going through my notes after the game. I'm like, wow, this stuff is hard. Like it, it's like not it, easy. This stuff is like it's a mind game as much as like the freak athletes are out there getting to the quarterback. There's no question about it. There's no doubt. And then 
you know, sometimes like for the fans, they get frustrated with the pass rush. To me, I'm, here's the things I'm looking at, right? Because I'll get front. Listen, there's nobody going to be more pissed off about pass rush if it's not right than me. <laughs> right, <laughs> yes. So the things I'm looking at is, okay, what kind of passes are beating us? Are they getting them? You know, is the ball coming out fast? Is it a big mm -hmm. RPO and quick game team? If that's the case, the pass rush isn't going to have a chance to get there anyway. The ball's yep. going to be out quick. But we can get our hands up, bat down some passes, things like that. There's other ways to affect the quarterback. You know, if you go out and you sack a quarterback four times and he threw the ball 40 times, and you sack him four times and you only hit him two other times, that's not a very good day rushing the passer. Right. You want him off the spot, hurried, hit, sack, at least if you can get anywhere around 30% of the game, that's what you're looking for. You're really, really doing good. I like I, In the D-line room, I say we're cooking with grease. We all like we like to fry things. It tastes better. So we're cooking mm -hmm. with grease if we uh, if we got him off the spot, sack, hit, pressure, 30% of the time, if not better. Anything less than that, then we got to really take a look at, okay, what's beating us? Is it boots? Is it sprint outs? Are they moving the pocket? You know, if that's the case, then, you know, we got to bring more edge pressure to try to stop that guy from getting outside of the pocket. If it's quick game, we got to get our hands up. But if it's your normal standard, you know, five and six man protections, then hell, these guys that we're, uh, that we're working with, they got to get rolling. You know, this is what they get paid to do. And that's the most fun part of the game is go rush a quarterback. So let's get it done. You know, that I'm glad you mentioned that. Cause that's like pass rushing needs context. Like, I think that's the, the main thing, whether it's, uh, uh, guys who beat double teams, guys who get like cleanup sacks, you know, um, whatever, whatever free rushes, sometimes a blown assignment. Yep. Yeah. Put all that into context. How, so internally, when you're assessing an individual player, whether you guys are like free agents or assessing guys after a season, how do you guys contextualize like their pressures or their sack numbers? You know, when you're looking at players. Yeah. So like if I'm evaluating a college player, if I want to get a true sense of what kind of pass rusher they are, I'm going to look at any second down and 11 plus and any third down and three plus from the last year to maybe even two years of his college career. Because those are obvious pass situations. He knows that his pass, and that's when you're going to see his best stuff. And well, number one, does he have any idea what he's doing, you know, setting up his rushes? He knows what he's doing with his hands. That's one. Can he get off the ball? Can he flip his hips? You know, can he turn the toe and, and reduce his pad level, you know, before a guy gets his hands on him, things like that. Just little intricacies of, intricacies of the position. So I'm looking at that, and then now I can I can evaluate it and say, okay, like a Jaron Reed. Jaron is a very coordinated athlete, very fluid, you know, and I use Jaron. I know he's not with us. We miss him like crazy. But he was a prime example of a guy who had no history of being a good pass rusher, mm -hmm. all right, coming out of college. But – I saw some physical skills in him, like, hey, this kid could do this with work, you know, and it came around with that because if you got good feet, if you can bend, you got good hand-eye coordination, and you play hard, you can be an effective pass rusher. I'm not saying you're going to get 15 sacks a year, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, getting, if you can get six or seven a year at D-Tackle, that's a hell of a lot better than just getting one. That's a, that's mm -hmm. a huge improvement. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the things that I look for, you know, with a, with a particular player. But if a guy can get off the ball, if he can bend, He's got good hand-eye coordination. You have the initial process of having, a, like, you know, steps, I should say, into developing a young pass rusher. You know, whether it was uh, the Malik McDowell pick, Rasheem Green, LJ, um, or even signing Carey, Pete and John have kind of made it very clear. Like, this is like the Michael Bennett role we like. You know, that, that five-technique guy who can who can play the three on obvious passing downs. Uh, why is that position and that skill set so important um, to Pete and the rest of the staff? Well, because – Initially, and we've kind of evolved a little bit defensively from where we were and some of the things that we were doing with when Mike B was here. But it's a position uh, because of the, the predominant front that they were playing in that heyday. In a lot, that position got a lot of single blocks. He was on the backside of a lot of plays. And Mike B made a living of, you know, getting off the ball and wreaking havoc in the backfield, you know, with stuff on the backside. But once the league kind of caught up with that deal, it kind of took some of those things away. Um, when they realize obviously what was going on. But for Michael, Mike, Mike doesn't get enough credit for how smart of a football player he is. You know, sometimes you get so caught up on the physical skills. He's quick, he's explosive and all those things. But Michael is one of the most intelligent football players you're going to come around. Yeah, he's going to take some risks and things like that. And he's going to jump off sides from time to time, taking his shots. But in terms of his intelligence as a football player, one of the smartest guys I've ever been around. You know, a lot of his playmaking came from that. You know, if you, uh, if you did a, a punt pass kick contest with Mike, Mike would be the first one to tell you he's not going to press you a whole lot running through drills. 
But when you just talk about playing the game and getting in between the white lines, one of the most intelligent guys you're ever going to be around. You mentioned earlier about the depth that the Seahawks defensive line has this season. Can you talk about that? What you guys are getting, what you think you're getting in Kerry Hyder from the film you saw and even briefly at minicamp. I know it wasn't a lot, but just talk about how exciting he is going to be with this unit this season. You know what? He's a guy I've seen him from even when he was in Detroit early on in his career. And um, similar to Mike in a sense of like, you could tell he's a very smart player and an outstanding fundamental football player and plays really, really hard. Um, and that's what he has shown since he's been here, even starting off in the Zoom meetings, um, highly engaged and focused and locked in um, with installing the defense. And once they learn it, the really good ones, they always start to look for, okay, where, where can I make my plays in this defense and this system? They always think ahead of the curve. Kerry brings that. Um, highly intellectual guy, really smart, um, good, sound, fundamental guy, and he communicates really, really well. You know, the thing for us going into the season, Jaron Reed was our game caller on the field. People that don't understand what that means, our game caller is like, you know, we make a huddle call as the defense staff, Coach Norton will send it in. But formationally, we have an idea protection-wise what you're going to do. I'll have the game set for that week, and now Jaron is the one that's calling that stuff out. It's the trust level between the player and the coach. But now, obviously, with him not being here, that was the big thing I challenged the guys. Is like, who's going to be that guy this offseason? So Rasheem, LJ, Carey, and Carey's the guy that's jumped out in the forefront of that and uh, has done really, really well. It's a very, it's a job that has a high level of responsibility on it. So Kerry's done an outstanding job um, since he's got in. Been really, really impressive with his work ethic and preparation as a pro. So he can rush inside, outside, hell of an edge setter against the run game. So happy, really happy to have him. We had uh, we had LJ on the show in March. Yeah. Yeah, something Maybe like that. Two months ago, so and yeah. We, we were joking. I was like, how did you guys in the D-line room feel that a safety led you guys in sacks? Uh, uh, <laughs> last, yeah, yeah, I see. <laughs> Rosie don't know Chris shaking his head right now. How did that go? I mean, I know you guys are happy for Jamal. Like, It's not jealousy. Like, your teammates, no, are obviously, same goal. But just, you know, it's always compete. So how did that go over in your room last year? You know, there's a lot of guys gritting their teeth, you know, gritting mm. their teeth about it because you just, as a D-lineman, that's not what you want. Right, as a D line coach, it's not what you want. You want the big guys handling that. Mm -hmm. But I'll say this: the reason why for me it was like, what of you let go because you're dealing with a guy who's a special, special player at that position. You know, Jamal is a special talent. Um, he's like a doggone nuclear weapon. You know, the things that you can do, and he's still, you know, still learning and growing in his game. You know, I can tell you right now for Jamal, yeah, he wants those opportunities. But Jamal will be the first one to tell you he wants his interceptions and his opportunities on the ball to continue to go up. That's for him as a player, he's going to challenge himself in that aspect. Uh, it's one of the things I love about him so much. He's always looking for ways to improve. But uh, we definitely don't want that to happen again. And I tell you what, Jamal would be the first one that would be happy as hell for a D lineman, like for that stuff to take off and get going. This is about whatever's going to help us go win as a team. But the D line guys, I can tell you right now, <laughs> they, want the hell, they might tackle Jamal before he can get before him get so, yeah. No, that's that's I like the competition there, yeah, because yeah, what nine and a half? Uh, yeah, Brazil, Jamal, yep. yeah, uh, league record. How about that? Yeah, how, so how, behind the scenes, how do you guys incorporate Jamal into your plans when you're setting up the games and just everything that you're you know setting up like in a weekly game plan? How do you incorporate like Jamal? Is he in the meetings too? You know, how does that go? In the, no, because he's never really been part of any of like any of the four and five man stuff, like obviously, he's in the blitz packages, um, like. But the pass rush packages, we have he has not been incorporated like that. But that could be something, you know, in the future that comes up. Um, don't want to tell too much when it comes to right, that. Right, 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 yeah. Um, you know, guys like Bobby has and things like that. He's been, you know, he's been part of the rush package groups. We haven't done that with Jamal. But, you know, like I always do hand drills and things like that in pre-practice. Jamal jumps into those things. Um, the whole thing about pass rush is this. you got to be able to win one-on-one -on -one matchups. And – this guy, he's beating tight ends. He beats. He's beating offensive tackles. He's beating running backs in one-on-one -on -one matchups, and uh, and just we go cut him loose because he just goes. He's like a damn rocket when he comes off the ball. Sometimes guys like that aren't going to be very good running any type of games and things like that with D linemen because they don't have patience. Mm -hmm. So we kind of try to keep him out of that stuff and just let him go look at it.
Well, yeah, no, going back to that Buffalo game, that's probably one of the best examples I saw last year. I think he go, he just bolts. I think he's strong arms like a tight end, <laughs> runs through a running back, ducks under a right tackle. Like that, that was probably that was like the whole pass rush repertoire from from a safety. Oh, Incredible, no question. no question. You guys did I, pick up Carlos. Oh, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. You guys were man. You guys did manage to pick up Carlos Dunlap, who the Bengals were like, "Yeah, bro, just go chill at home. We don't think we can use you anymore." And the Seahawks were like, "Word." We'll definitely tap in with this guy, and we'll use him the right way. Talk about what he brought to this Seahawks defensive line unit. You know, a guy who was a proven one-on-one rusher, you know, and experience, you know, and obviously it came at the unfortunate situation of a guy getting hurt. So we lose Bruce. Um, he tears his ACL in that New England game. And then now we bring in Carlos, but also because of the injury, it gave Alton Robinson an opportunity now also to move up. So the same way we didn't have the depth early in the season, that depth changed when we got the trade of Carlos, but also Alton came into the mix too. Um, but what Carlos gave us another experienced pass rusher, uh, somebody that could work alongside of, of Jaron to be on the same page. Sometimes when you're dealing with a young player and they're still just making sure they, they're doing the right thing in terms of the execution of the game plan, they're not playing the game, you know, and seeing – the pre-snap tips and tendencies and things like that that you need to know. And it makes it hard if you got a veteran guy playing next to the young dude to get him on the same page with you. It can lead to some frustrating times. So to get Carlos next to, to Jaron definitely helped out. Um, you know, and it gave time for those young guys to be able to come along. You know, and then obviously, you know, another quality interior player also collapsing in the pocket and helps Carlos out too. So it was good being able to get Carlos from that standpoint and uh, be able to go cut him loose without a doubt. I do want to ask you this because Mike and I have had multiple discussions about pass rush versus cornerback. And what I mean by that is if you have an elite pass rush, you can have semi to decent corners. Whereas if you have elite corners, but a semi to decent pass rush. And in between that, is there a line that's drawn where you need to have, you want to have one or the other, or you want to have them both equally. You want to have them both equal so you can go out and just, dominate for for the most part because you look at the the Rams for example right they have Jalen Ramsey elite corner and then you have Aaron Donald an elite defensive lineman it's very rare that you have two of those positions locked down in some situations you don't so can you talk about that dynamic there where it helps to have an elite pass rush and then you can have decent corners because guess what the pass rush is wreaking, wreaking havoc in the backfield and the quarterback doesn't have time to get the ball off so even if you have you know Mike and I playing corner <laughs> there's still a chance that we can make a play on a ball for example so I just want to hear that, and if you can explain that concept there, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I, this may sound crazy, all right, but even as a D-line guy by trade and a D-line coach, um, I do not believe in the theory that great pass rush makes up for horrible coverage. <laughs> that, I, that does not exist. you got to be able to cover somebody. Yeah, right. right. Because here's the thing. So we can't make the team, Chris. <laughs> Over. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be able to cover somebody because here's the thing. I can, I can eliminate, if you have a great pass rush, and I'm talking from a coach's perspective, if you have a great pass rush, I can do things to help eliminate your pass rush. Yep. I can go seven and eight man protections. I can chip. I can sprint out. I can boot. I can go up tempo to tire your pass rushes out. And when you think mm -hmm. that you're going to bring new fresh bodies on the field, when I go no huddle, you're going to get 12 men on the field. I have so many tools at my – discretion to be able to help neutralize a great pass rush okay if you have great cover guys you have great cover guys all the rules i mean it I, there's nothing i can do to, to eliminate that i got to try to do different things like okay if you got great man to man guys i got to try to pick and rub and all that but if they can play zone and they're smart i can still eliminate a lot of things that you're trying to do in the passing game too what i'm saying is you got to have both Yep. You can't just mm -hmm. be so dominant on one side of it. Yeah, if you got great cover guys and the quarterback's back there reading the damn book, okay, <laughs> then eventually somebody's going to get open, obviously. Yeah. Right? But in today's game, the game has changed so much. That thinking of great pass rush makes up a bad secondary play, yeah, that probably held true a long time ago. But the league has turned into a great passing league. The rules set it up for it to be a great passing league. you got to have a combination of both, okay? You absolutely have to. Um because if you don't, great pass rush, like I said, you can do things to eliminate it and slow it down. Think about it. Every time people play Tom Brady, Tom Brady picks everyone apart. Why? Because he can figure out 
the coverage and he doesn't give the rush a chance to even get to him because the ball gets out of his hands so fast, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, there's certain things, and that's why I, I talked earlier, you know, I need to know, like, what are, what are they doing? Is it quick game? Is it boot? Is it RPOs? Like, how is the offense throwing the ball that is the offense, the, the pass rush could be successful successful or not successful? Um, so to answer your question, I think you got to have a combination of both, not all one way than the other. Yep. Um, if, you pray, if you put great rush out there, but you can't, <laughs> you can't cover, you can't cover a soul. You're going, to, you're going to still be in for a long damn day. So. <laughs> yeah, especially in today's game. You know, yeah, these kids, these come, they come in ready to sling it. That's yes. Just, yeah, this is how it goes. Um, I, I apologize to our listeners here. We we talked about thirty or so minutes, and we haven't got to the most the most popular player on the team yet. Uh, I believe maybe outside of Russell, uh, Clint. Let's go. Let's go to 2013. You're the rec you're recruiting co recruiting coordinator and D line coach at Louisville. And you come across a 285 pound defensive tackle who's only 5'10. And you about Hilton to get 5'7 at that point. <laughs> yeah, from Hilton Head Island, South uh, Carolina, named Puna Ford, um, who comes on a visit. Just what do you remember about that? Like early days of meeting Puna Ford. Yeah, so we had our summer camp at University of Louisville, and we get hundreds and hundreds of kids that come out there. So once we separate everybody into their position groups, um, we would go way back to the far. It was like field three, how it is in Seattle. That's where the D-line would do our stuff during the summer camp. So all the kids come down there or whatever. And uh, Coach Payne was uh, is Puna's high school coach. And he came up and said, Coach, I want you to take a look at this kid, Puna Ford. He's not tall, but, Coach, I promise you he's going to hit a growth spurt. <laughs> I tell me times I would hear that as a college coach that somebody's going to hit a growth spurt <laughs> uh, 20 years later. But he, uh, <laughs> but he told me about this kid. So I said, okay, well, whatever. And sure enough, things are going. And I see this kid, little short, squatty body. He looks like damn SpongeBob. <laughs> and, uh, and he is unbelievable, like quick as a cat, you know, had unbelievable balance. And, you know, when you look at certain body types, you don't expect it. Like, mm -hmm. he was like a deep freezer with feet. So I'm just telling you. <laughs> oh, I love like, that. You would never expect to see some of the things athletically that he could do. And so the coach comes to me after the practice session and says, hey, coach, that was my kid. His name was Puna. And so I look, he pointed out, he said, his grandmother's here. So I look over to the side of the field, and his grandmother's got, like, you know, those old nylon uh, little porch chairs and stuff. They'd be, like, oh, green and white. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. It'd burn you up if the sun was on too long. <laughs> so, yeah, she's over there. She's, like, boy, she throws her hands up the wave. His grandmother's everything to him. She's an unbelievable lady. And so um, he was familiar with Coach Strong because Coach Strong was the defensive coordinator at University of South Carolina for a long time. And they – they played great defense back back during that time. So that was the initial draw to come out to Louisville. And he did the camp back-to-back -back years. And I told Charlie, I said, listen, the second year he came, he had hit that growth spurt. And he got to all the five. <laughs> so I said, I said, Charlie, I said, you know what? I said, let's take him. You know, let's go ahead and take him. And, uh, and let's roll with it. Because I said, everything that you look for in the three technique, he's quick, he's powerful. Um, you know, we I can coach the rest of it. And plus, you know, it was hard to get guys like that at Louisville. And um, and I had Sheldon Rankins at that time. I had coached there for the previous three years. So I said, hey, that'll be the next three technique right in line coming right behind him. So, and um, the rest of history, he's unbelievable. Um, and of course, Puna goes to Texas, uh, following Coach Strong uh, after that. Uh, and then in the twenty in April 2017, I believe he comes out here for a pre-draft visit uh, with Seattle. What, what do you remember about Puna visiting uh, the Seahawks before the draft? So he came out, you know, he was Big 12 Defensive Lineman of the Year, you know, played his butt off there. And uh, but he didn't get a lot of attention. We were his only top 30 visit that he got from anybody. Oh, wow. so I explained to him, I said, All right, I said, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna be honest with you. And all the guys will tell you, I don't cut any corners. I'm gonna, even if I know it's gonna hurt their feelings, they're better off when you tell them the truth. Uh, so I said, Listen, a lot of this stuff with these players that's gonna get selected early in the draft and even when it gets to later rounds, it's a beauty contest. Who's the tallest, longest, most muscular, prettiest guy? It's like a beauty contest. And I said, Puna. You've known this since you were in high school. You're not winning any beauty contest, buddy. <laughs> uh, if you don't get drafted, if you bring your butt out here, I said, with your work ethic, I finally get a chance to coach you because I didn't get a chance to do it in college because I had left for the NFL. And obviously he went to Texas. I said, the rest of you, we'll make up for it. We'll get this thing done right. I said, because you got all the talent in the world. Just people don't know it yet. And I know it hurt to hear it, because, but he's been dealing with people doubting him all his life you know, in, 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 in his football life. 
So um, the rest of his history, he decided to come on after the draft, and we're lucky as hell that we got him. What's the, uh, the undrafted uh, signing period? Uh, John Snyder calls a rookie free agency. It's a scramble. Like agents it's, throwing it's, numbers it's, out here, GMs, cause scouts. How like how involved were you at, at all uh, in the process of uh, kind of getting Puna in here? Just how happy were you when you did land him? That's the most involved we are. I mean, outside of doing um, our college eval and looking at the kids on you know on film, Pete and John are doing the whole draft process. Mm -hmm. But the college free agent side of it, the scouts and the coaches, we take that and we run with it. So now it's like, okay, who are the, your best recruiters, you know, and can get guys in. And it's a really challenging time because, you know, the agents are working both the phones. The kids have got – their phones are blowing up off the hook and they're still dealing with, you know, the anguish of I didn't get selected and they had a lifelong dream of hearing their name called. So it's a really – it's a challenging, challenging time. Um, but uh, I would say that's the one phase of the draft that the coaches are the most involved in is helping to recruit um, the, the guys who are undrafted, without a doubt. I want to know what makes Puna so special because – his demeanor, he, he, I, I'm not in the locker room all the time, so I don't get to see him and see if he communicates with reporters and talks a lot. But from the most part, it seems like he's just laid back and he's just there to go to work and get his job done, and he does that. He what does. Is his oh, what does his demeanor contribute to why he's loved by everyone and respected so much? So humble. Um, yeah, he's quiet. He's a man of few words, but he's so, so humble. Um, you know, when he does say something to you, you know it's coming from his heart. Um great teammate very caring about others one to help them get better and there is you know sometimes players they can have a bad work day you know whether you know something's going on at home or whatever the case may be you know bad mood get a little cranky get a little snippy you know uh, or they got a bad practice you know and whatnot he is like the model of consistency you know exactly what you're getting every single day how he's going to come to work, how he's going to carry himself. His mood never changes. And this guy is going to work his behind off every day and not change, not one bit. His effort running to the ball, uh, his effort in drills, he's very locked in step with everything we do. Over-exaggerate every single detail and fundamental of the game. And it shows why he's such a great leader may not be so much like vocally you know he's never going to be one of those guys going to stand on the soapbox and start screaming to the mountaintop you're not getting that and that's okay yep. a lot for this generation a lot of these guys they learn by what they see these visual learners so they see him and the way he goes about his work every day um that's why he commands so much respect from everybody you know his consistency as a person as a player his work ethic uh, he's phenomenal yeah you said man a few words i can probably count the number of them i've gotten in an interview from it's probably it's probably in the single digits uh, but just yeah. go out there just just go out there and, and, and gets it done i i think uh has he displayed his sack dance since that game in san francisco the uh, belly rub the belly, the rub. belly rub yeah 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 has he has he brought he needs to bring that out again got to get him as a, a i don't, I don't, I don't know if he's brought that out since then uh yeah got got to get him out there uh uh more on that man because uh it really not well, not shocked me, but it was impressive to see what Puna who was that. This was just year three, uh, this last year. It kind of reminded me of Jay Reed in year three, where it's just the pass rush skills just, just started to to turn up there. Is there something about maybe taking a few years for those interior guys to develop those skills and really show those pass rush uh, the skills? That they got? Linemen, it's it's not a it's not an overnight position, you know, to just hit the ground running and go take off. It's a grown man position. It's not like playing wide receiver and running back where. You know, a lot of your physical skills could be on display once you get the ball in your hands and you show that. The interior trend, the, the trenches, interior line play, the fundamentals and the techniques and the ability to see things pre-snap, especially when the college game and the pro game, even though the pro game is starting to change, there's still enough, uh, there's still a high level of enough of differences in the games. It takes time for these guys. You know, it takes time for these guys to come along and learn stuff, figure it out, and, you know, what is their knowledge level? What is their development level coming from the college ranks coming into the pros? Because a lot of times when you're talking about taking a kid out of college, okay, you're talking about um, arm length, height, weight, speed, athleticism, things like that, because those are the things that get valued. But we're not talking about where is the skill development at? You know, like how good is he with you? Yeah, he's got 36 inch arms, but he doesn't play with good length. He doesn't know where to place his hands. He doesn't know how to lock out a blocker. He doesn't know how to shed. 
uh, versus various blocking schemes. He doesn't know how to refit his hands. Those things take time, and they don't happen overnight. Unfortunately, we're in a game where you make a lot of money. There's a lot of pressure. So time is not of the essence. <laughs> right. Yeah. You don't have that. You got to get rolled. You know, so it's, just, it's part of it. But that's why when you see guys hit like year three, um, you really should see them come out of their shell and you know what you have without a doubt. Uh, this this story is already out here. I don't know if you knew it was, um, but I, I want to hear our listeners hear from you directly. Uh, it's November sixteenth, twenty eighteen. You guys are playing the Packers on Thursday night, and it sounds like a poor, poor, poor projector at halftime. Yeah, yeah. There's the face palm there. Like I said, we're not breaking news. It's already out. One of our uh, guys uh, did a story on it that game. Um, the story. I'm gonna go read the headline here. It's quote. He got some air on that bad boy. Clint Hurt flips a projector, sparks the defense. Um, have you apologized to the projector? Um, what what first what happened? All, what happened at, at halftime? I don't deserve all that kind of credit. The players took care <laughs> of that stuff on their own. Um, yeah, I, I was I was not real pleased about that. When you have a specific game plan going in, and uh, and it's like you just abandoned the game plan, and you had like you weren't in practice the entire week. There's probably nothing that is more. That can insult you more than system, something like that, mm. you know. So, uh, yeah, I kind of let loose a little bit. You know, I try to calm down. I've got kids now, so I can't really <laughs> outside of myself. I try to keep the peace and smile a little bit more, so I don't scare anybody in public, you know. But when I got into uh, at halftime, I, was, I got into a dark place real brief. <laughs> Understood. Well, we I mean, I, I, there's some quotes from this. A quote from Jacob Martin. He said it was sweet. Uh, uh, he said you guys get him getting chewed out like that, like pissed him off in a good way. Um, you know, Quentin Jefferson said, "Shout to Q Jeff." He said like it fired him up too. So it helped. You get you deserves some credit. I think Rasheem had his first sack of the season, maybe that game. Yeah, he finally. Yes. Thank God. I remember. I remember getting <laughs> sack because uh, Frank jumped all over him. You know, Frank was so happy. He finally got off the snide and got him a, you know, got him made him a play. So, so it was good. You know, we got we got two for, two more for you, Clint. Uh, speaking of uh, Frank, um, you know, after Mike B gets traded and Cliff gets hurt, um, heading into that 2018 season, how, did you know that Frank was kind of not ready to just take that jump on the field, but like as a leader as well of that room? Absolutely, Frank. Uh, he's one of my favorite guys I've had to coach. You talking about being depressed? I was sick for I was sick for a while after that one. I probably I was sick the whole following season. Just because, <laughs> you know. That was the first challenge I had when I came in here. I was like, okay, building a relationship with him. Like, you know, Mike and Cliff were already already established. Do you know how this, this game works in the pros? You know, it's like, okay, develop Jaron and Frank as players, but also leaders because they're the future of it all. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, but obviously it's a business and crazy things starts happening. And I'm looking at Frank and I'm telling my wife, I'm like, this dude's going to be 15 sacks a year. So he's got <laughs> so much talent and just freakish ability. Um, to him, and I said, and I said, he's got great leadership skills. You know, when he speaks, very eloquent and you know, right on point. He's like timely. You know, Frank's not a guy that talked all the time, but he was always timely with his words. And um, and the pairing of him and Jaron was like awesome because they were like two peas in a pod. They were super super close. You know, so it worked out great. But um, you know, Frank just seeing where he came, and again, he was a guy that was highly skilled, talented, had a bunch of different moves, but it's like didn't know how to put them together you know i think when i first came in here i made a comment he reminded me of the comment uh going into his second season where i said you know he's um, unbelievable running games but i said i thought he was under i thought he was below average as a one-on-one pass rusher and he had told me later on that it pissed him off i didn't know it pissed him off but hell i mean it's what it is (laughs) so he was was pissed off about it and i said listen i said you're a jack of all trades and a master of none yeah, mm-hmm. you can spin, you got a long arm, you got touch and go, you got sizes, you got all these different things. And I said, you're not using anything to set up another rush. So I said, you know, you got to have something that's your go-to. I said, if it's third down, if it's third down along or it's a two-minute drill and we need to get off the field to go win, what is your go-to? And I said, okay, if that's the go-to, here's a counter off for that. And I said, when they're sitting back and playing you soft, you got to have the ability to go speed the power to collapse the pocket and keep them honest and let's take off with it and let me tell you something that's why i felt like last year we had them i said oh this is we're just scraping the surface on where this thing is going to go and um but yeah he's an unbelievable talent and a great great dude speaking of unbelievable talents Jadavian Clowney, you guys the Seahawks were able to land him in 2019 right before the season kicked off what was your initial reaction to that trade 
that ha- that went down? Uh, when we initially brought him, super excited. You know, it was just like, you know, you are licking your wounds a little bit for where it was going. Like, man, we yep. lost, you know, really good young player and you understand yep. the business side of it. And then, yeah, you know, the only thing I, I love getting JD in here, I hated losing Jacob Martin. Mm, you know, yeah. hated losing Jacob Martin. So it's like, and as you can see on the coaching side, they always say you want to try to keep your personal feelings out of it. But listen, if you're worth anything as a coach, you have relationships with your players, you have relationships with their families, and you genuinely care about them. Um, and I do, you know, with all of my guys. So I was happy as hell to get uh, Jadavian and get him in here. Um, freakish talent and ability. Um, unfortunately, I would just say for that year, besides the San Francisco game, which he absolutely went crazy on. Man, you Ooh, know, man. Uh, <laughs> career game. <laughs> yeah, we just did some things. We, you know, I, the system and things that we were doing probably weren't the most conducive. Like the wasn't the best situation for him to most max a lot, maximize his talents and abilities. Right. Um, but uh, unbelievable talent, great and uh, great kid. I'm gonna I'm gonna read a duet quote here from that story. I'm sorry, I'm going back to the projected thing. This no, it's great. It's a great, great story. It's a great night. Uh, this is a quote from Q. Jeff, uh, paraphrasing you that night at halftime. If you're supposed to be in the gap, be in the effing gap. If you're supposed to be here, be here. If the corner's supposed to set the edge, set the edge. If you're supposed to be in the B gap, be in the B gap. If we do what we're supposed to do, can nobody f with us? That's some good words right there. That makes me want to go out there and sack Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> <laughs> Like How about that. we'll pull his flag? Yeah, I, I like that. So you say you don't deserve much credit, man. That's I mean, Bradley McDougal was quoted in here too, man. Lit the whole defense up, man. It was a big, yeah, it was a big win. Prime you time. Know, too. I appreciate them. The players make it work. We give them guidance, but the players got to make it work. So I give them the credit. Yeah. No. Well, actually, I got one more I want to ask because I was curious about this. You said no one gets more frustrated about pass rush performance than you. Was the Arizona was the first Arizona game one of those Ooh. as as well? I think it was like fifty dropbacks, no QB hits on Kyler. Uh, yeah, that part night. of that, you know what, part of that was going into that one, and you can see going into the second game we played them, you know, game plan-wise, it was a lot of three-man rush, all right? So you're not going to get a lot of sacks and a lot of hits in three-man rush. If anybody goes right. back and watches that game, we rushed three and we dropped Shaquille Griffin off, or uh, Shaquille Griffin off like a spy. Because, mm-hmm. if, you know, obviously if Kyler took off running, we kind of want to have him there because he was the only guy we had that can be able to go run the guy down, get him on the ground, and force him out of bounds. So... I didn't have a huge fit. It sucks. I hate the feeling. You know, you never like it. No D-line coach likes three-man rush. But if you put in a game plan, I, how, who am I to go fuss at a player about a game plan if I don't try to go get it executed as a coach? <laughs> right. It obviously didn't damn work. You know, hell, I'll go and I, I'll take the blame for that. It didn't work. You know, we come back and we played them the second time around and, and uh, came victorious. So, you win the game listen, on a sack. Yes. <laughs> how about that? Win listen, the game. We could, we couldn't give a quarterback COVID in that first eight games. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was bad. Yeah, no, I mean, that's why I like to, I mean, Bobby doesn't say a lot to us. He does, but he doesn't at the same time. It, he's the loudest statement he could make is after that Arizona game. I think he had two sacks on blitzes uh, against the Niners the very next week. That was all we needed from Bobby right there. It's like, if we can't get to the quarterback, I'll go. Like, I'll go get there and got, got Jimmy G twice. Uh, the very the very next week. That's some that's some leadership right there. If you guys can't go get there, I'll, I'll get there. Yeah. Uh, we uh we uh, definitely it was a big it was a big turnaround after you know we had the debacle in Buffalo, you know the Rams game we did some good stuff but there was some bad things too, but yeah. you could still if you're a coach and you're looking at the film we saw ourselves making some changes some adjustments and then after that Rams game we kind of took off and went with it defensively and made some big strides. Yeah, no, we're, uh, I, I speak for the Seahawk fans, uh, and I'll speak for Chris here in a second. And we're excited to see what happens in 2021. Yeah, like the second half of that season, it just uh, the, the, the flip just switched. switched and it was yeah. Jamal, every you know, Jamal, Carlos, you know, Benson when he's healthy getting in there, and then you know, Puna, Alton, it was to Jay Reed getting like, after it, even without Jay Reed, you swap in Big Al and bring Carey. Like, we're excited, we're excited to see, yeah. we're excited to see what Jamal can do with healthy fingers. And a shoulder, uh, you know, and a and a healthy elbow, and healthy <laughs> Everything. shoulder. Healthy, man, <laughs> nine and a half sacks, dude, would beat the hell up, man. Yeah, man. yeah. No, we're very very excited, man. We uh, Clint, we appreciate you joining us on the show, man. We love the insights, love hearing about your story and your background. We don't get to hear about assistants much, you know, even yeah. the coordinators. We don't know much about, you know, uh, so we love learning about you guys. A lot goes into to coaching. It's more than just breaking projectors, you know, like you said, it's relationships, <laughs> it's teaching. It's it's recruiting. You know, you were able to recruit Puna twice. That matters. You yep. Know? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
yeah man we, we appreciate you we got to get you back on maybe at some point after the after the season uh thank you thank you so much thank you guys for tuning in to the seahawks man to man podcast i think clinton and dave and busters right now or his kids going nuts so you're gonna yes. let coach go you guys catch us uh the next episode we appreciate you coach you have a good one and good luck this year thank you guys man appreciate you guys take care all, all right, right man peace Bye-bye.